A collision happened on Saturday night. And, uh, yeah. So we got more Fighter Fest. And this one, they finally, they gave up. They You can tell now what the pecking order, the importance is going to be because they had to be in Londinium on Sunday. So they couldn't do live collision on Saturday night in the United States. That would have been a little a little difficult. So they taped this past Saturday, August 26, collision, the same night they did that stinky dynamite that we just talked about, I believe, somewhere earlier in this marathon edition of the program. And this was even more... They just, they gave up. They said, fuck it, if they it's going to be Saturday night. If they ain't bought it by now, they ain't going to buy it. We don't have time. If we only had time, we're going to do a lot of pre-tape shit. We're going to do some short matches, get some people some wins, and give them a main event get the fuck out of here. Was that basically the the feeling you got of this program? No, I felt like it was Dynamite Part 2, and then the last 45 minutes it was Collision. Well, that's another way of putting it. I think we're we're in we're in concurrence and agreement that this was not a stellar offering from the uh, collision folks on Saturday night. It didn't feel like collision. That was no, the it, issue. yeah, it it was. We didn't get the pre tapes. It went straight to Elton. They didn't have time to do that. You know, these guys have for the past fucking year they've only worked one or two days a week. They get a busy week and nobody can bring them in and say, okay, we're we're having a pre tape day. Where we're gonna get these fucking two or three pre-tapes for the open of the program. Uh, Kevin Kelly and Caprice Coleman were the announcers. Nice to, because Nigel had obviously gone across the pond in anticipation of the event. Caprice did great. He's very good. He's yeah, very he's good really in a completely good. different way. Yeah, really good. But then, as we mentioned, it looked like dynamite, because the first thing we see is here comes... Old Jungle Jack, who is going to have an eventful weekend, which, well, don't worry, folks, we're going to get to it. But it hadn't happened yet as of this. He comes out dressed as the douchebag that he is, and he's got Stooges carrying the FTW belt on a giant platter with the flowers. I don't know what, it's the funeral service for the belt. He's going to bury the belt tonight. And the ring's set up for a funeral. What do they call the thing that they were carrying that the belt is on with the flowers? Is that a funeral? It's not a pyre. That's when you're going to fucking burn something. A funeral dirge is music. It's a funeral something or other. I'll get it. Funeral pyre. Come on, baby. Light my belt on fire. <laughs> so it looked like a cheap raw. And he started giving the eulogy for the title belt. And my comment was that this kind of segment needs somebody with a lot more personality than Jack Perry to carry it off verbally. Was that, would you concur with that? Or do you think that because he has made strides from no personality to a semblance of one, that that's a step in the right direction? He's made strides when he has the sunglasses on. It really works well because he looks like who it appears that he may really be. <laughs> and the talking is the issue because he doesn't have the voice for it. No matter what yeah. he's saying, the voice is part of the problem. Well, it's not only the voice, but the conviction that is not within the voice. Even if right. he was right. still sounds like he's fucking going through the fucking awkward phase that Jerry Mathers went through when Beaver Cleaver's voice started changing and he sounded more like Foghorn Winslow. <laughs> Stop me before I sub-reference again. It, 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 it does, he doesn't have any conviction. He's just saying it. Right? He's a bad actor. But anyway, um, he he fake cried, and they played a video of him in ridiculous poses with the belt that's been a part of his life, and then he goes to take a sledgehammer to it. And all of a sudden, when he's going to take sledgehammer to the belt, the hook video appears. He's doing chin-ups with his back to the camera and a menacing voiceover. And then they cut back to the ring and Hook's standing in the ring behind Jungle Jack. And he beats up Jack Perry and suplexes him through a table, puts the belt on top of him and walks out. So, it, it Hook, it, Hook's exciting. When he shows up, something fucking happens. But, um, but that's what happened. 
whether the lights go out or music plays or a video plays, the heels just stop anything. The guy's about to smash the belt. He stopped what he was doing to watch this video. Let me stop what I'm doing. This may be an important message. Yeah. Let me hear what he's going to say. This is an important message from the National Weather Service. Did Hook, sh- did Hook show up and I like, hand him the video, play this, and then I'll sneak up behind him? Like, how yeah. did that work out? Well, obviously, Taz, who is oh, an yeah. announcer. Yeah, good point. Obviously knows the production crew, and whether he wants to, to admit it or not, he is obviously engaged in some type of concerted effort. Maybe uh, they could get him on Rico. He's, he's involved in a conspiracy with the sound guy and the, the technical director, the director and the truck, and so many more. You know, for someone who's not a big guy, he's in good shape, but he's not a big guy. Hook carries himself like a big guy, and that makes you forget about it. And, it, you know, it, he's committed to what he's doing. It's not often that you see him. He's, he's the stone face. He's not the laughing and joking. And, what was it Dusty used to say? When everybody's in the back laughing and joking, I'm going to be in the ring, baby, cooking and smoking. And speaking of smoking, smoke is now rising from the yard because my gardeners have showed up with a great variety of power implements that are oh, going to no. drive you and the rest of... For the all-in <laughs> review? Really? The Arcadian Vanguard Network completely out of their mind. We're on an odd day. Can we time travel again? You want me to turn this on? Quit it. Stop it. Just uh, act like they're not there, ladies and gentlemen. (laughs) So anyway, they did an MJF and Adam Cole package. And then we are treated on collision to the site of Pockets, our little puppy Pockets coming to the ring. And that's where I said that they've given up now. It's a bad Wednesday night show. And we got Pockets and Penthouse and Eddie Kingston against the Butcher, the Baker, and our little friend we haven't seen in so long, cute Pip Sabian. And they went into an immediate six-way and went to the floor. And so I said, I'm not going to watch a garbage match involving jobbers and mascots when we got all this wrestling this weekend. So 14 minutes of television time later, it was over with. Except they came back from a break And now not only are Pockets and Penthouse and Eddie Kingston still in the ring for a promo, but they've been joined by the Puddin' Gang. So they are determined to drive the viewers away. Our little island of, of, of legitimacy over on Saturday night has now been invaded by the Lollipop Guild. And the people that have gone to Saturday to get away from that, now we've, we, have no, we have no recourse, nowhere to turn, nowhere to run to, baby, nowhere to hide. What is wrong with Muffin Top Taylor's face? Does he have the heartbreak of psoriasis? Has he been performing felching on a fucking jackass? Has he, been, has he had his face farted on by a zebra? What the fuck is going on? I didn't know that would be one of the... Uh suspects here but i don't know this is the first time i've noticed eczema acne i don't know what exactly it was but it was so noticeable it almost looked like he was burned like his skin was like really badly sunburned or something it looks like he was on his hands and knees crawling up behind trent's mom's minivan trying to put a potato in the tailpipe when she hit the fucking gas you know what the problem is the best friends are the one remaining tag team from the original crop of aew like the indie tag teams that the Young Bucks wanted to work with and brought in. They're like the last remaining ones because Tony fell in love with them. And Tony got a kick out of them and the stuff with the mom and the van, put Orange Cassidy with them because Tony loves Orange Cassidy. It keeps these guys around. But boy, as soon as you see the best friends on your TV, it's death. You just want to do anything else. And I did. I watched the, uh, the game that was on. Well, I, but you missed one of the great quotes. In all of wrestling history, imagine this, ladies and gentlemen, and then we're going to move on here very quickly, but you got Pockets, you got Penthouse, you got Kingston, you got the Puddin' Gang. They're doing an in-ring promo on what's allegedly a national fucking television program. And And Trent says, with a straight face, 
In these are the baby faces vowing revenge on the fucking heels in the bad garbage match they're going to have at Wembley, the football field fuckery contest. And Trent says, "You sons of bitches broke my mom's van," and was acting like he meant it. I say you should work like you mean it, but the material has to back you up. Anyway, the BBC pop up on video and say some things, and Kingston freaks out and runs to the back to find them, but he couldn't. He couldn't find where they were shooting the video, so he <laughs> bullies a cameraman and cuts his own promo just in the back, yelling at, at when he was just in the ring with other people doing a promo. It, it was all almost sad in terms of the, when you watched, you watched a professional television production organization on Friday night do those tributes, and you watch this malfeasance of the broadcast arts. It was jarring. And then we had another package with FTR and the Buckaroos. And then did you enjoy the next tag team confrontation there, playa? I don't know. What from, was the next? I don't remember. From memory. From memory. What was it? From the next. It was a tag team. Conf oh, the tag team. I, I skipped this match, too. This was the um, the Dark Order. Little Brutus and Long John Silver of the Dork Order competed against Action Andretti and Darius Martin. Remember Action Andretti, the next great superstar? Okay. So then after that match. In the back, and they graphic this from last Wednesday, they had Darby Wayne, or Darby Wayne. <laughs> Darby Wayne. Darby, they had Darby Allen and Nick Wayne standing there, and A.R. Fox is on the other side of them. And A.R. Fox gives the apology and the explanation. And normally I don't go into this much detail on a pre-tape, but God damn it. He gives the explanation and the apology for for what he did, turning on Darby and trying to murder Nick Wayne, leaving him in a pool of his own blood to bleed out at his fa dead father's own gym. And A.R. Fox says, I, you know, when I lost that match, I, I just panicked. I thought everybody lost faith in me. So I just basically, <laughs> because he lost a match, he panicked. He thought everybody lost faith in him. He turned on his longtime friend and he stabbed this kid in the fucking head with broken glass. So I turned to a life of crime. I turned to a life of crime. For three, I turned to three weeks of crime. But now, I'd like to apologize. I'm so sorry. I'll do what, I mean, he's got his hat in his hand. He's got a lot of shit in his hand. Hat, dick, everything's in his hand. <laughs> <laughs> And he's standing there apologizing. And Nick Wayne looks at him and then just walks off. And as he Dar should, as he as should, because he, he says to him, he goes, I can't do anything to change any of that, but I can give you my word. Yes, I can give you my word that obviously is is good. Says I just turned on yeah. this guy three weeks ago I've known for 10 fucking years. Nick Wayne's smart. He said, fuck this, I'm out of here. <laughs> But he, but the thing is, he walked off. It, it was bad acting when he walked off. I swear to God, the kid's in over his head. He's still too young. He's got that mope face, and instead of any body movement or changes in expression or some type of angst that he was going through, he just he took his cue and just forty five degree angle walk off. And then Darby Allen says, "Hey." I love you, man. And he hugs A.R. Fox. <laughs> this is the best character in AEW, guidance counselor Darby Allen. Because that's what it is, right? He's the guidance counselor to everyone now. <laughs> oh, Brian, we've, we've known each other for all this time, but next week I'm going to break a fucking glass picture frame of your dead father over your fucking head and puncture an artery. And three weeks later, I'm going to apologize. I expect you to take my hand and shake it. If Jim Cornette did any of those things and told me the reason he did it was because he panicked because he lost to Orange Cassidy, I would believe him. <laughs> I would believe you. <laughs> I'd believe you with that reason more than A.R. Fox.
By the way, the life of crime would have continued. Swerve Strickland turned on him. Well, that's true. Yes. He didn't say I've had enough of this in your evil ways. It's three weeks is enough. He said, wait, what? <laughs> Don't do this to me. That's what he said. That's right. He didn't even tell Swerve told him get the fuck out. So now, of course, he's coming back with dick in hand to beg his former friends for forgiveness because otherwise he's goddamn pariah because you can't trust this son of a bitch. He will stab you in the back in a heartbeat and then have you arrested for carrying a concealed weapon, even if you're a friend of his. All right. Every feud, it's either Guidance Counselor Darby or everyone's <laughs> fighting over who's friends with everyone else or... The best friends are upset because something happened to their mom's minivan. Like when we say it's all friends wrestling, it's like become that. It's become what the parody is in terms of everyone of these feuds is some like childish feud. Do you think that Tony also, when he was a kid, he wished that his mom carried him around in a minivan instead of the chauffeur with the limo and the whole nine yards? And and that's why he likes the the minivan thing because he always hey, wanted to be in the minivan friends and we could have had been in the minivan with my mom and she could have taken us to Dairy Queen to get ice cream. But instead I had the chauffeur and, and the fucking partition, the bulletproof glass and the partition was up where I was isolated until I got back to the compound at the mansion. That's when you'll know they're desperate when they introduce the evil chauffeur as a character. <laughs> like I'm the secret 50% owner. Your dad gave me everything. <laughs> I was recording all those, <laughs> all those secret conversations your family had all those years ago, and now you'll give me money. All right, so speaking of giving us, giving them money, we certainly wouldn't for the rest of this program. We had an acclaimed music video in a gym and a parking garage. This was great. Did you watch this? Not really. This was great. This was one of the best things the acclaimed have done in as long as I could remember. It was getting back to how they got over a clever... Well done rap video, great lyrics, you know, for wrestling related stuff. Really well done. Best thing I've seen with the acclaimed in a long time. They couldn't afford a goddamn location. They had to just do it out in the back of the building, though. It worked. What location did you want the acclaimed and Billy Gunn to be at? <laughs> a different one besides the one I was watching at the time. <laughs> they were outside a hospital. Oh, oh well, that makes all the difference. <laughs> Long as they're outside the hospital. Big Bill wrestled Buddy Morales, Pedro's illegitimate grandson. The guy was five feet two and 135 pounds. So, yes, the size difference was even more marked with Big Bill. But at some point, just for the visual, can these guys please not look, or please look like athletes and not look like children with you know, the fucking rub-on tattoos that wandered in from the county fair in the parking lot. There are way too many people in wrestling, both guys who have good pushes and guys who are just like this appearing on shows who have really bad tattoos. Yes. I'm not saying all tattoos look bad, but some of these people, I don't know what they're thinking, and it's not pleasing for the viewer. Well, but really... the. <laughs> This guy, there wasn't much space on him to begin with, and anything that you could cover up about his appearance, I would vote for, but it just it didn't work. And then the 9 o'clock hour was Willow Nightingale against Robin Renegade. Are we just going to fucking roll over and show, them their, uh, show us their belly and play dead? I mean, what? And that just was what, followed two, up. Two Go things. ahead. One, clearly this was an episode where I don't care what they say, it's almost, it felt like they gave up yeah. this week. Secondly, Willow Nightingale's good. And I've never seen Robin Renegade and her twin sister at ringside before, but they were not bad. This match went longer and was more competitive than it probably should have been. But Willow's one of the unique women wrestler personalities that stands out. One of the few in AEW you could see on a WWE show, I think. If you close your eyes and think about it, she's good. I'm not saying she's not, but I'm saying at the nine o'clock hour where you're trying to go for Steve Austin I, in the ring with the rock. Instead, you get, you know, the undertaker tombstoning Mario Savoldi or whatever. Mario Savoldi. Or Angelo or <laughs> Jumpin' Joe or any of the other 
family members. Uh, Keith Lee is dyeing his hair again, and uh, he wrestled a guy named Vicky Dice. Zicky, they said. Vicky, Vicky Zicky? No, Zicky Dice. Ah, well, he's very icky. Here, talk about another one with some tattoos. Um, so yeah, that was that. That was all right. You know what? For again, he had tattoos all over the place. It looked like a modern day Don Fargo at the end. But <laughs> you know, he had, you know, he was except Don was tougher and had a better body. But you know, he looks, I guess, maybe because he's older and he's been through shit. He looked like a wrestler. He kind of was yelling at him, and you stopped and you said, Who is this guy? And then he got his ass kicked. But he didn't do bad. Keith Lee's most interesting thing was leading the fans in a sing-along. I'm surprised they remember to bask in his glory. What has happened to him? I mean, all this stuff swerves now mixing with all these main event guys on these shows. They're trying to do something with him. They never did anything with him and Keith Lee to really pay off. There must be a reason for that. Keith Lee's barely on these shows anymore. I And then he just I, randomly shows up on a tape collision for a squash match? That's what I hesitate to say anything because I'm, you know, if he does he have health issues? I know he had health issues at one point. But if he's got health issues, one would think that would preclude him from coming out and doing bad four minute squash matches um, as well as do anything regular. So I don't understand, you know, but again, I don't want to say anything just in case, but. Jesus Christ, shit or get off the pot. Did you see what was next? The video. The. Who is. Somebody has decided that they're Quentin Tarantino in that company. And they're making everything look like some kind of bad art house fucking cinema production. Lucha Underground. Is that what that looked like? Because I didn't ever like watch it. That's what it looks like to me. Well, did they have any refugees from that off-brand mud show promotion seeking shelter here in AEW, or what's going on? I'm not sure what's going on. What did we see here? Was it a murder? So what it was? No, it was a, a, actually a mass murder. Because if if there's over three people killed, that's a mass murder, right? Is that what the qualifier is? I, I don't know the qualifier. You would know about mass murder qualifiers. Better well, I've tried to read up on it just so I can skirt under the fucking limits. But from what I understand, they had the video of the kidnappers that kidnapped Preston Vance. I don't know who, who, who. It's not an owl you're hearing. That's his name, Preston Vance. And some lucha guy that was with him. And they kidnapped him and threw him in a fucking van last week. This week, a very stylized, artsy-fartsy video of the kidnappers beating these guys up while they've got bags over their head. They're tied to chairs. It's the classic, you know, movie-type beating, right? And then suddenly, and bear in mind, this is Preston Vance and some fucking lucha guy. I don't know who the fuck this guy is. He's got a mask on, all right? They've been kidnapped. They've had hoods thrown over their heads. They're being beaten by a room full of perpetrators, gangsta-looking individuals. And this is, again, Preston Vance, who had never won a goddamn wrestling match in his life on this show. And another guy, we don't know who the fuck it is, and they elude their bonds. They break the fucking rope. They get up and make a comeback. And in some kind of goddamn bad kung fu movie scene, they beat up and kill the kidnappers, all of them, and leave them laying in pools of Hollywood blood. They let the cameraman live. They let the cameraman live to tell the tale. They learned that from our friends, the DraftKings, up on Boot Hill. And then the last scene is Jose, the assistant, blurry, so you're not supposed to know who it is, but it's obviously him, in silhouette, opening a door with light behind him and applauding, doing the slow clap. Like, I knew that you would be able to overcome this. This was the first of the tests that I'm putting, or whatever the fuck this is going to be. This was the phoniest looking fucking shit I've ever seen on a wrestling program. And on this program, in this company, that's saying something. 
and it's not going to get pressed in Vance over, and it's not going to help any of this stuff. None of this matters. This is just like a vanity explanation vignette series for stuff that's not going to get over. Somebody's a friend of somebody, so well, let's do something with so-and-so. They've got an idea. And and Jose, he knows a guy with a camera in Mexico. And, I mean, this is how this shit comes together. You can tell. We just talked about a goddamn network quality television production facility that can do massive tribute videos in a 24-hour turnaround, and these fuckers are all film school students that think they're going to be the next goddamn Kill Bill Volume 14. All right, is it time for our main event? Now it's time for Collision. And Collision started with Samoa Joe doing an in-ring promo. He's the king of television. I remind you, as he reminds us every week, as he should, to get something over. And the deal was that he can't interfere in the main event tonight or he's going to lose his match at All In with Punk at Wembley. So he's going to do color at ringside and not interfere in a match. And it's, again, he's got great delivery. And he gets it, how to present a fucking image and how to get shit over and verbally and make shit seem important. Imagine that. So he goes down and sits at ringside to do color with... I wasn't sure who was goddamn wrestling in this match for a minute because it's Sting and Darby and Hook and Punk, but the entire heel roster came out for the match on the entrances. Their opponents ended up being Swerve and Brian Cage and Dino Douche and Jay White, but they had both Gun Boys and Christian and Juice out there at ringside. So it was a little confusing at first. But anyway, at that point, we had a goddamn a real wrestling match involving some level of talent, and they tried to be serious about it for the last 20 or 25 minutes of the show. Like you said, Collision suddenly broke out after Dynamite Part B. And it was nice to see Terry Funk forever on Punk's wrist tape. But, um, but anyway, you know, again... It was a good match. It wasn't to the level of the recent collision main events, but on this program, you couldn't argue, but they got some heat on Punk. Punk got the tag to Hook. He made a comeback. They stopped him. They got some heat on Hook. Hook cold tagged Punk. Punk got a comeback, did the Hogan ear cup, and the fans were booing him there because they're on a Wednesday night crowd. So the little buckaroo bonsais had, had bought the tickets. So he had fun with that and milked the booze. And then everybody hit something over and over. And then finally Punk got the go to sleep on Brian Cage, but got the Kakina clutch that Joe uses for the tap out. And as soon as that happened, Joe said, gentlemen, correct me. Is the match over? Yes. Boom. And he's off and he's in the ring. And it's a, it's supposed to be a big fight between Punk and Samoa Joe. And Perry came out and jumped hook at ringside. Everybody got in a fight. But the camera, to be honest, was on almost everything but Punk and Samoa Joe. And they're the only money issue in the whole thing. So we saw a little bit of their fight and a lot of everybody else blathering around the ring. And that's pretty much what we got out of out of colliding with with co when collision collides with dynamite. It's a popcorn fart. You know, we haven't talked about the ratings for collision in a little while. I don't have them in front of me right now, but they have not been good the last few weeks. And whether it's running against a WWE pay-per-view or the upcoming preemptions, I worry about this show. I mean, if you look at that collision main event, that was a lot of the what has become the normal collision roster. Jerry Jarrett was able to make it for a little while with like a roster of nine people in 79. <laughs> Not everyone could do that. There has to be an influx of some new energy, I think, or just some new personality on the show. I don't know what or who, though. 
And and that is, and, and I've seen on Twitter people saying over the last week, well, why didn't you say something about the Rotten Collision rating? Well, we did say something about the Rotten Collision rating SummerSlam weekend. We skip one week and people are up in arms. They did not come back last week for Collision, the week after SummerSlam. Um, and that can be uh, usually attributed to Football or whatever, in this case, there was apparently not a big football game, but there also, that was the week, there was nothing advertised in the way of CM Punk having a match or involvement, and that's the first time that that's happened. And that, as we've seen, plays a part, I would think, in the number, because whatever quarter they put Punk in, people seem to find him, and there are some that's just going to watch for what he's doing. And conversely, as you said, when when either a football happens or the monthly premium live event from the WWE that you know takes up a lot of the what at least as we saw a couple several hundred thousand well several a few hundred thousand of the viewers you know Saturday night program is going to be the one to ta to bear the brunt of that Wednesday for the foreseeable future, is going to do the same thing, I think. Again, it's going to start about where it's been starting, and it's going to drop 20 25% over the course of the show. It will be interesting to see, which so far it has, collision, no matter where they start or where they finish, it's kind of steady. They just need more of them, and they need a, a more... A lot of people were saying Saturday night was such a crummy night for television to begin with, They've proven they can get 600, 700,000 on Saturday night. They just need to do it uh, regularly. And the, the preemptions and or the conflicts with other major programming are a bigger detriment to, your, to a wrestling show's viewership than just the night it's on. If the wrestling fan wants to watch it, if it's on the same time, same day, same station, He'll find that. But if it's bounced around or there's similar programming in opposition to it that's not a regular show but a big pay-per-view, once-a-month event or whatever, that's a little bit more problematic. Well, like this coming week, WWE Payback is Saturday night. AEW All Out is Sunday night. So you would think Collision would be a big show leading into... The pay-per-view event, I don't know, uh, is it live in Chicago or is it taped? I got to double check here. But right there's the problem. WWE is running a pay-per-view right against it. Well, and again, also, the collision was putting up a string of great programs to establish that's how you get over. When you're a great wrestler, a great tag team, not a gimmick, but the as we used to say, a great working wrestler great working team repetition seeing you constantly always having good matches delivering that's the way that type of talent gets over collision was being regularly featuring good matches great main events and a serious program and that will develop a following but only if it's consistent and so inconsistency in terms of this week being a throwaway show who knows what's you know going on in the future with some of these other programs that are up against pay-per-views. They need to still keep, for the viewers that are sold on the program and that are dedicated and are going to watch it regularly, they need to keep producing for those people as well as so that the word can get out that if you watch on Saturday night, you're not going to see the fucking you know, trampoline cowboys. You're going to see the wrestling program. They came back up on that by putting pockets on the fucking show just because they're all in the same locker room or it destroys the... The only appeal that Saturday Night have has is that Punk is going to be on it and it's the wrestling show. Otherwise, it's just another program from AEW and Lord knows we already got plenty. Yeah, I mean, I thought Collision was going to be AEW's attempt to cater to the fans that don't necessarily think pro wrestling gorilla is cute. And that's what it typically has been. But when you have an Orange Cassidy on there and the best friends and that kind of stuff, and all of a sudden the Mexican cinematic drama <laughs> segment and all these things, it's not the show we were promised. It's not the show that, even if you want to say it wasn't a promise, 
It's not the show that it's been when people have been raving about it. And we heard from a lot of people that said we saw what was happening and we turned it off. So it'll be interesting to see how the ratings are for this week. But that was AEW Collision. I hate to bring this up because it may, it, again, you were a very young man. You, you've heard about it. I mean, you may have heard about it at the time, but the full impact of it may not have registered on you as a eight-year-old child or whatever the fuck. But when Turner Broadcasting had bought Crockett Promotions, become WCW, Jim Hurd was in charge, and they had a bunch of people in the TBS corporate offices that thought, well, they could come up with ideas to sell that, that wrestling show they got now. And they did the mini-movie for the Bash at the Beach pay-per-view with Vader and Flair and all those guys where they had the midget in the scuba diving oh, outfit. Yeah, cheat him. That wasn't the the bomb on the boat. That's right. It wasn't Flair. Let's take him out of that. It was Sting and Davy Boy versus Sid and Vader with Harley Race and Colonel Robert Parker. Okay, I'm, and I'm sorry. Flair was on the episode of Baywatch out on the beach. I was seeing him on a beach. But nevertheless, the midget blew up the boat, and they showed the boat blowing up. The midget blew up the boat as part of this plot in this mini-movie that was a uh, what they thought was a promotional vehicle for the pay-per-view. Instead of It didn't have any wrestling in it. It had guys running around on a boat and on the beach, and the midget that blew it up. And the fucking wrestling fans... Universally, everybody that watched WCW said, what the fuck are they doing? That was one of the big happenings that started turning, well, not started, they were already started, but really turned a lot of the old NWA and WCW fans against this fucking whatever the fuck they're doing to our wrestling program. The fans were offended by what the suits were doing to their wrestling. If that happened 30 years later, do you think that now with the way that the the wrestling fans have basically given up hope and they've made new fans that think it's all supposed to be silly, I guess what I'm saying is, would the midget that blew up the boat have been the next indie wrestling darling getting booked by everybody in the fucking country? Maybe. It depends on his price. I think a lot of fans would pay to take some money on the boat or next to the boat or the remains of the boat. That's what it would be today. But I don't know. But, but again, that was what main eventers. I don't know if anyone's going to want to take a picture of Preston Vance and the other kidnappers or dead kidnappers, whatever was going on there. But once again, that was AEW Collision. Well, what's going on when you collide with the Wrestling News and the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network this fine summer week? Another action-packed week in professional wrestling, so of course another action-packed week on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. Get information about all the shows on Twitter, at Super Podcasts, or on Facebook, at facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. A few notes, of course, the Wrestling News. Your daily free wrestling morning newscast has just celebrated its first anniversary as a podcast, as a podcast delivering free wrestling news to you each and every day. Subscribe today wherever you find your favorite podcast, Arcadian Vanguard's The Wrestling News, or get it directly from thewrestlingnews.com. Wrestling news you can trust. It's dependable. One full year of proof of that. The Wrestling News. How old is it? One year old. The podcast. Happy birthday! Well, thank you very much on behalf of the uh, Enterprise. Also this week on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, a few special notes. Breaking Kayfabe with Bowdrin and Barry returns with a special Terry Funk tribute episode. Get it today at BowdrinPod.com or look for Breaking Kayfabe with Bowdrin and Barry wherever you find your favorite podcast. Also a Terry Funk tribute coming up this week on Shut Up and Wrestle with Brian Solomon. Check that out wherever you find your favorite podcast or get it at SUAWPod.com. And of course... The 605 Super Podcast. The Mothership! <whistles> Go through the archive today at 605pod.com. Available wherever you find your favorite podcasts. The Mothership!
my ship! Hey. Yeah. Yeah, what? <laughs>